So, as, as you know, I have been conducting a series on and off, mostly off, it seems, lately, um, looking at the various names that Jesus is given in the scriptures, and there are many of them. Um, I had a list of about a hundred, and uh, the one that we're doing today isn't in that list even, so I know that the list is far from complete. I wanted to talk about eternal life this morning um, because it is a very important subject. And uh, in the first uh, eight months of this year, I have seen uh, three people who were very important to me pass into eternity. And uh, one of them most certainly is a believer and is with the Lord now. Two of them, most likely not. There is no, uh, one can have no real confidence. One can only trust in the graciousness of God. It's a critical subject, um, one that we need to reflect on. And I was prepared actually to put my series on the names of Christ on one side so that we could talk about eternal life this morning. That's what I was going to do. And then as I started to prepare it, I came across two texts from 1 John. And I realized that I wasn't going to have to suspend the series on the names of Jesus because Jesus is called the eternal life in this book and elsewhere in Scripture. So let's read these texts together and then we'll get into this subject. The first of them is 1 John 1 verses 1 through 4 where John is opening up his subject and right from the beginning you know, he doesn't give you any time to draw breath and get into the plot he just hits you wham with some truths that are very very difficult to understand but very glorious it's very typical of John's style here's what he says what was from the beginning He's talking about Jesus, by the way. Let me give you that clue. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. You see what uh, John says in that second verse? The life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. And it's not an it. It's a who. It's the one who is the word of life. That life that was manifested, that was with God from the beginning, we proclaim to you the eternal life. And now look what he says later on in the book, chapter 5 and verses 19 uh, and 20. This is a good verse, a pair of verses to remember. If you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe there's any proof that Jesus is God, there are many places to go, but... This one is perhaps one of the most obvious. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Jesus, 
is the true God. Jesus is eternal life. And so I, as I read through these passages, I thought, well, that's a name for Jesus, isn't it? The eternal life. And I don't have to suspend my series and I can talk about this very important subject this morning. Um, there was a TV show once when somebody said, I love it when a plan comes together. But this is a, a critical um, question. What is eternal life? If I had asked you that question before you took a sneak peek at the bulletin, um, what is eternal life? Some of you, I think, probably would have said, well, it's life that goes on forever. And, uh, and you're right. And some of you might have gone further because you'll have heard from pulpits from time to time, yes, that's true, but it's more than that. For a believer, it's more than duration. It's actually a quality of life. And that's true too. But after what we've just read, I hope you can see there's more that we can say about eternal life. How many of you would have answered, if you hadn't seen what the bulletin says, and you're coming through the door, and I say to you, what's eternal life? How many of you would have said it's Jesus? How many of you would have said it's knowing Jesus? Because that is more than everlasting, that is more than quality, that is eternal life because he is the eternal life. That's what he says in the Bible, that's what we're going to see this morning. And that's going to be the basis on which I'm going to ask you to examine your own experience of God. Your own claim to be a recipient of eternal life. And see how it matches up with what Jesus says in the Bible. And we're going to look at three things uh, very simply this morning. First, that Jesus is eternal life in himself. <laughs> Secondly, that being true, what is eternal life for a Christian? Thirdly, what is eternal life for you this morning. So then, Jesus is eternal life in himself. We've seen John call him in two different places already the eternal life. Let's look at some more scriptures to uh, unpack uh, what John is saying about Jesus here. I should say, by the way, there were some handouts at the back with these verses on. And if you want more of them, if there are not enough to go around, we can print some more later. They should appear on the screen as we go through these. First of all, John 1 and verse 4. We've already seen this earlier this morning. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. That's what John says about Jesus. What does Jesus say about himself? John 5 26, You've seen this one too. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son also to have life in himself. And then two other very well-known passages where Jesus is talking. John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus talking to Martha just after Lazarus has died. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then John 14, 6. We could almost say this in unison because we know it so well. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I hope you can 
put these verses together in your mind and see that Jesus not has life, not possesses life. Jesus is life. We could say it's intrinsic. There's a big fancy word. It's inherent. It's part of who he is. He is life just as water is wet. If you can find water that isn't wet and isn't frozen or, or whatever, well, that would be a very strange thing. He is life just as fire is hot. He is life just as the sun is dazzlingly bright. It belongs to him. It's part of his being. It's an attribute of him. And because he and the, and the Father are one, it's something he shares with the Father. The Father has life in himself. The Son has life in himself. And because he's the eternal Son of God, he's always had life in himself, and he always will have life in himself. When Peter preaches um, a message in Acts chapter 3, that's what he says. It's very interesting. Acts 3 and verses 14 and 15. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are all witnesses. I don't know if we have the... Uh, okay, we do have the, the modification up there. Thank you, Cassia. You'll see that by the word prince, I have put in brackets author, and that is because the word has both of these meanings contained within it. He authors and initiates life, this Jesus. He writes it into being, if you like. But the word means that having done that, he then goes on to govern it as prince. He commands life to do his bidding. He gives it. He takes it. He is the prince of life. And then it's no wonder if, if you turn back to Genesis 2 that you'll see him doing this. Verse 7, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Who is the one who breathed life into Adam's nostrils? and made him a living soul. John 1 verse 3. We read it earlier. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus did it. The author of life summoned Adam to life from that clay. And as the one who is the author of life and who is the prince of life, he not only gives life, he not only writes it into being, he sustains it. Hebrews 1 and verse 3. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Do you realize that the only reason you are here this morning is because Jesus is upholding you. He is sustaining you. He gave you life. He is maintaining your life. If he stopped doing that right now, we would all disappear. We would all vanish out of existence into the nothingness from which this creation was summoned by the word of his power. So when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and when John says, he has life 
in himself. I hope you can see that it was no empty claim. Here is the one who is the prince of life. He governs life. He gives life. He takes it away. And he showed us this, didn't he, when he was here on earth. Mark 5 Verses 41 and 42, the synagogue ruler's daughter, taking the little child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha cum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. Luke 7 Verse 12, the, the, widow, the son of the widow at Nain. As Jesus approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up, began to speak. Jesus gave him back to his mother. And then John 11, that account of Lazarus. When he had said these things, he prayed to the Father. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Now, others raised the dead in the scriptures, but it was not quite as effortless as this. In every case, there was much prayer, there was much agonizing and then God graciously granted the request. And here is the one who is the prince of life and he just utters a word. And the spirit returns and the person comes to life. I can't resist telling a story about Lloyd-Jones. Um, apparently when he was in Sunday school as a very young lad, they did the story of Lazarus. And the teacher said to the class, why did Jesus say Lazarus Come forth. And after a bit of silence, this little hand goes up at the back. It's Martin Lloyd Jones. And yes, Martin, what's the answer? If he hadn't said, Lazarus, come forth, they would all have come forth. And he was right. He was right. We read it at the beginning of this service. The day will come when he will speak with his voice and all the dead will rise. Those who have done good deeds to a resurrection of glory. Those who have done evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. He speaks, we sang. And listening to his voice, new life, the dead Receive, And I want you to understand that these miracles he did show that he is the Prince of Life. There's no doubt about that. But these are resurrections of those physically dead to, to physical life. We need to understand that these are pictures of a deeper truth, that the one who is the eternal life can also raise those who are sp uh, dead spiritually and can give eternal life to those he wishes. That's what he says. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And then John 5, 21. For just as the Father raises the dead, and gives them life. Even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Is that your Jesus this morning? The Prince of life, 
the one who can give it with a word, the one who can take it away? Is that your Jesus? Or is he this kind of wishy-washy Jesus that's become so popular in the, in the church because, because he's no threat? He's just a good buddy. He just lives to serve us and do what we want. Not this Jesus. Not the Jesus in the Bible. Reminded of what C.S. Lewis says about the lion Aslan in that conversation. Isn't he safe? Safe? He's not a safe lion. But he's good. That's our Jesus. So that's him. He has eternal life in himself. He's had it forever. He's demonstrated it time and time again. So then what's eternal life for Christians? Because I think an understanding of the fact that Jesus is the eternal life should make a difference for us. It should change our expectations of what eternal life means and what it should be like for us. And Jesus helps us to understand that in his high priestly prayer, John 17. And uh, the first three verses, we're going to meditate on these for a little while. Jesus spoke these things. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, <clears throat> that, the, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you had given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life. Now listen very carefully, everyone, to this. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See how Jesus defines eternal life for us here? It's a relationship. Yes, it goes on forever. Yes, it has a quality about it that our lives here do not and cannot have. But fundamentally, eternal life is a relationship with God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says it's about knowing him. What kind of knowing Jesus is eternal life? Well, it isn't knowing about him. That isn't eternal life. It's not memorizing all kinds of facts so that you could go on to jeopardy. And if all the questions were about Jesus and about the things that he did when he was on earth, you could score a hundred percent, you could ace it. That's not what he means at all. And I want you to bear with me here because this is um, something that maybe some of you know, but we need to do a little bit of a deeper dive here because this is the heart of eternal life. Remember Jesus says it is knowing you, the one true God, and knowing Jesus Christ whom you sent. Well, let's take a look at Matthew 1 and 24 to 25. It's an account of the nativity. How, what's that got to do with eternal life? Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now, uh, yeah, again in square brackets, there is what the Greek literally says when this translation says that Joseph kept Mary a virgin. And it literally says he was not knowing her. And the Greek word is the same as the word that Jesus uses when he says eternal life is knowing him. And then Luke 1 and verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how can it be? How can it be that I'm going to become pregnant? How can it be that I'm going to bear a child since I am a virgin? 
And again, the Greek word, the literal translation of that is, since I know no man. And again, the Greek word is the same as Jesus uses in John 17. Here the word is used, I think you can see very clearly, of the union between a man and a woman. The bodily union. And yet Jesus uses that word in terms of eternal life and what it means. So what he is saying is that eternal life is a very, very intimate thing. It's an experiential knowledge. And it, it seems a little bit shocking to say it. And I must say, you know, as a preacher, you, you think twice before you go into territory like this. But Paul speaks of the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5. And he says it's a mystery, as, as we'll see. Husbands, he says, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then we'll skip down a little bit and pick up the reading here. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. You see what he's saying there? He's saying that the wife is the flesh of the husband. Because of the union that exists between them, she is his flesh. And when he cares for her, he is caring for his own flesh. And nobody ever hated his own flesh. We care for it. If, we, if we're cut, we put a band-aid on. If we've got aches in our joints, which are increasingly I'm finding is true. I'm not sure why that might be. Then, then we put some cream on. Um, or in the, in the current epidemic of bad knees in the fellowship, we use straps and, and various other things and uh, trust that the Lord will give us healing. We look after our own bodies. Obviously, we do. Well, he says when a husband looks after his wife, he's looking after his own body because... He is one with her, one flesh. Just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. Okay, see where Paul is going with this argument? He's saying that there's a union that's happened between Christ and the church in which when Christ looks after us, he's, he's essentially looking after himself. We are members of his body. And he doesn't hate his own flesh, as it were but nourishes it and cherishes it. And then he gives us the scriptural background for this, going back into Genesis when Adam and Eve came together. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh. And now comes the staggering part. This mystery is great. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So just as the husband and the wife come together in union and they become one flesh in the sight of God, Christ has come together spiritually with his bride, the church, and they are one in his sight. <coughs> Nevertheless, says Paul, even though I'm talking about Christ and the church now, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Can you see how intimate this knowledge of Christ is that he says is eternal life? It is comparable, but I think at a spiritual level and probably far beyond anything we can truly comprehend, it is comparable to the intimacy that exists in the union between a man and a woman in marriage. And it's a mystery. But eternal life is a relationship 
with Jesus Christ, an intimate, experiential relationship. He is the eternal life and He has joined Himself to us with you know, indivisibly. Nothing can separate us. He has bound Himself to His bride. And what could happen to us in joining the one who is eternal life, who is the Prince of life, who commands life, who gives life? Nothing other than this, that we live. How could it be otherwise? So that's eternal life. An intimate and very experiential relationship with the living God. Now, is that your experience of eternal life this morning? Is that my experience? See, I, I'm not sure that it is. And at least if it is, I'm sure there's further we can go. How do we have this life? How do we obtain it? It's a gift. That's what uh, Jesus says in the high priestly prayer, chapter 17, verse 2. You gave him authority over all flesh that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. We've seen it, the prince of life. He can give life. He gives it to whom he wishes. And in joining himself to believers, he gives them eternal life. And we already saw this in another script, scripture in 1 John 5, 11. The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. Not any life, the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And it comes as a gift and it comes by faith. John 3, 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. When we trust the Lord Jesus, when we rest in him and all that he did in his work of salvation, we receive as a gift eternal life. We receive Jesus. He joins himself to us. And that will show itself, John says, in a life of obedience. When does it happen? Sometime future, isn't it? Eternal life, it's something to look forward to. Well, yes, it is. And no, it isn't. It begins the moment you believe. That's when you get eternal life. The testimony is this, this is 1 John 5, 11, that God has given us eternal life, past tense, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life, and so on. It's past tense. The moment you came to know Jesus, you have eternal life. That means you have entered into this intimate, experiential relationship with Christ. It's not something you're just looking forward to. It's something you should know now. He should be that real to you as a person now. Your relationship should be that intimate with Him now. If you can find a different meaning to these words... I would love to hear it. Eternal life is an intimate, experiential, here and now knowledge of the true God and of Jesus Christ, his Son, who is the eternal life. And it's a gift that he gives to all who will receive it, and it is received simply and only by faith. So now to conclude, just a few questions for us. What is eternal life for you this morning? And I'm asking this question, I'm asking it of myself. Does it measure up to, to what we've seen just now? If I'd asked you when you came in through the door, what's eternal life to you? Would you have said, oh, it's Jesus. I love him. He means everything. 
the relationship that I have with him. He speaks to me through his word. I, I, I draw near to him in prayer. I sense his presence in my life. The Holy Spirit prompting and leading me into righteousness. The assurance that I am secure for all eternity. That's eternal life. Or would you have said, well, it's living forever, isn't it? Can you see there's a difference? Eternal life is not to know about God or about Jesus. We're often content, I think, with a knowledge of doctrine or of biblical facts. We delight in election and to talk about the mysteries of election rather than to delight in the God who chose us before the world began. We're thrilled by substitutionary atonements, big term, sounds very theological, and, and we can talk at some length about it, but we should be thrilled and adore the one who is our substitute and not get carried off and away by the doctrine. The doctrine is only supposed to show us Christ. It's not supposed to stop there. That is not eternal life. Yeah, we were reading in reading the Bible together um, Song of Solomon just recently and for some of us Parts of that book are a little bit of a challenge because it's a book about intimacy between a husband and a wife. And there are many people who take it and say, this is a picture of the love between Christ and his church. And it, it's quite explicit in places. It's quite shocking. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God, that they may know Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Eternal life is knowing him as a bride is known by her husband. Do you know him that way this morning? Is that your experience of eternal life? How do you feel about the Lord Jesus Christ? This is what Spurgeon says. This is from our chapter on Wednesday, so this is a plug to be there. Do you not long for his presence, my fellow believer? I know you do, if you are empty. For there is no such fullness or such satisfaction in all heaven beside as can be found in him, under whose shadow we sit with great delight when he brings us into his banqueting house and his banner over us is love. Sometimes I think we have, uh, this is kind of a bait and switch, we have, uh, we've settled for a very pale reflection of, of what the Bible t says is eternal life. It's like we're groveling about on the floor underneath the banquet table hoping to pick up a few scraps and if we would just get up and look, the table is full of all the good things we could possibly imagine. It's a banquet spread for us by the love of our God. And it's meant for us to delight in it and to, to, to enjoy to the full. And we're not there, friends. I'm not there. That's not what eternal life often is to me. It becomes a matter of routine. And then we start to accept it and be content with where we're at in our relationship with Christ. And that's not what I see here. There is more that can be known here and now of Christ. There is a depth of relationship. And we see it in, in people in the history of the church. You can see it in Spurgeon. He's gone far beyond us in terms of his love for Christ and his relationship with Christ and his desire, his, his sold-outness for Christ, far beyond us. And it, you can't read uh, what he writes without his, his heart of love for Christ and for the lost coming out. Do we have that? Is that our experience of Christ this morning? 
And it starts right now, friends. Let's not excuse ourselves that we don't have this experience of Christ, but we'll have it in glory, and that's when we're meant to have it. No, no, no. We're meant to have it now. The eternal life himself died so that he might bring us to life now and experience glory now, not in its fullness, but a foretaste, more than we are often content with in our lives, I am sad to say. So I'm not asking you if you know your Bible and and if you say your prayers, although we all should be doing that, and I'm not asking you if you're a Calvinist or an Arminian this morning, and I know which side of that debate I would be on, but these are labels. That's unimportant this morning. I'm not asking you if you are reformed with a good capital R or tending towards being liberal with a very small L. These questions vanish, vanish in comparison with the main question, which is this. Are you, this morning, in an intimate relationship with the eternal life? Or to borrow from a commercial that you will know, have you got Christ? Because only if you have him do you have life. Let's spend a few moments in quietness and ask the Lord to speak to us and to help us to respond as we should.